It is a fact of life that we cannot afford everything we want. This is no different in the healthcare sector. Governments have budgets. Insurance companies must at least break even, and so decisions must be made about how to spend limited resources. Whether a decision maker chooses to fund a new healthcare intervention or not can be influenced by a number of factors. One of these is economic evaluation of the intervention in terms of costs and health outcomes. Others include clinical data, medical need, ethical considerations, political pressures, and budget impact. Economic evaluation of an intervention, such as a new drug, involves comparing the costs and outcomes with a suitable comparator. The correct choice of comparator is the current standard treatment for dealing with the health problem. For example, the most commonly prescribed drug in the treatment area. Choosing the correct comparator is important to ensure that the economic evaluation results are not misleading. Analysis of the additional costs and outcomes of an intervention over standard treatment is a key concept in economic evaluation. It is known as incremental analysis. This helps to inform the question should the new intervention replace standard treatment? In some cases, the answer is clear. If a new intervention improves health outcomes at reduced cost, its benefits are obvious. And if it worsens outcomes and increases costs, using it would be irrational. However, most often a trade-off occurs between costs and health outcomes, usually improved outcomes at an increased cost, although sometimes worse outcomes at a decreased cost, and a judgment must be made about whether this represents good value for money. Economic evaluation can help inform this judgment. Before an economic evaluation is carried out, the scope of the study must be determined. This includes choosing the comparator, as discussed, and the perspective for the evaluation, which will be covered later. The time horizon must also be chosen. This specifies the period over which costs and outcomes are considered. The length of the time horizon depends on when the effects or side effects of an intervention occur. The time horizon that is typically chosen is a patient's lifetime, although shorter periods may be used depending on the aims of the study or the chosen health outcome. Once the scope has been defined, data on the costs and outcomes of the intervention and comparator must be obtained and analyzed. The results allow conclusions to be drawn about value for money. Modeling may be necessary during this process. For example, if outcomes have not been measured over a long enough period for the chosen time horizon. Sensitivity analysis is also important to assess the reliability of results. These techniques are explained in the Access Evidence Learning video about modeling. Economic evaluation can take a number of forms which all deal with costs in the same way but deal with outcomes and express results differently. Let's first look at costs. Economic evaluations should ideally address all costs incurred in providing a healthcare intervention, including the cost of current and future consequences, for example side effects and clinical events such as heart attacks. Costs can be split into three categories. Direct medical costs which include the costs of resources used within the healthcare sector. Direct non-medical costs which include the costs of resources used in other sectors, and indirect costs, also called productivity costs, which include the cost of time lost by patients or carers due to a condition. Which costs are included in an evaluation is determined by various factors. One of the most important is the perspective taken. This depends on the purpose of the evaluation and who it is aimed at. Society is the broadest perspective and includes all costs irrespective of who incurs them. This gives the most comprehensive assessment of an intervention and is often advocated by economists. Narrower perspectives, for example the patient, provider or, most widely used, the payer, only include costs relevant to that group. This is not necessarily a problem but one needs to be cautious as some costs that are excluded could change the conclusion about a treatment if a broader analysis was carried out. For example, significant costs may be ignored or cost savings that are identified may actually just be costs that have shifted to another group. 
costs used in economic evaluation should be discounted to reflect time preference. That is due to the fact that people prefer to defer costs and receive payments sooner rather than later. Everybody would rather be given $10 now than be promised them in 10 years' time. When costs are discounted, they are expressed in present-day terms. This is called their present value. Costs occurring during the first year are not usually discounted. Costs in subsequent years are then discounted by adjusting their value based on a discount rate and the number of years in the future they occur. Let's take an example where a cost of $1,000 is incurred each year for three years and discount at a rate of 5%. The first year cost is left undiscounted and costs occurring in years 2 and 3 are discounted using the formula. All three values are then added together to give a total present value of $2,859 compared to the undiscounted total cost of $3,000. Outcomes can also be discounted in the same way, on the basis that people prefer to receive benefits sooner rather than later. Discounting costs is well established, but whether outcomes should be discounted is widely debated. The discount rates used are also a topic of discussion. Many current guidelines recommend that both costs and outcomes should be discounted at the same rate, although what this rate should be varies between guidelines. Now let's turn from costs to outcomes and the analysis of data. Broadly speaking, economic evaluations either measure health outcomes in monetary terms or in non-monetary terms. In cost-benefit analysis, both costs and outcomes are valued in monetary terms. This can be achieved in a number of ways. For example, by conducting a study to measure people's willingness to pay for the described outcomes. The analysis results are usually expressed as the net benefit, which is the incremental outcomes minus the incremental costs. A positive net benefit means that an intervention is worth adopting. In other words, the benefits of the intervention exceed the costs. However, a negative net benefit means that the intervention may not be worth adopting, as costs exceed benefits, although other factors may play a larger role in the decision. Cost-benefit analysis has a strong underpinning in economic theory, and so, it is preferred by some economists. Also, because outcomes are always expressed in the same units, comparisons can be made between alternatives with multiple and different outcomes. Additionally, the willingness-to-pay approach is a broad concept that can take into account the delivery process of the intervention, such as administration, technique, and location, as well as health outcomes. It also reflects the fact that society may be more willing to pay for certain treatments, such as those for cancer. The main disadvantage of the cost-benefit approach is that it is methodologically difficult to measure individuals' true willingness to pay. Alternative approaches use clinical measures of outcome. Cost-consequence analysis essentially involves a descriptive listing of all the costs and outcomes of one or more interventions. This means the decision-maker must synthesize or integrate the information themselves, but it may be useful if it is unclear which health outcome they consider important. Cost minimization analysis may be used when the interventions being compared have equivalent health outcomes. For example, if two drugs have similar effects on duration and quality of life and cause similar side effects. The results of the analysis are simply the total costs of each intervention, and it is only necessary to choose the least costly option. Because it involves only cost comparison, Cost minimization analysis is intuitive and easy to understand. However, since equivalent outcomes occur fairly infrequently, applications of this type of analysis are limited. Cost effectiveness and cost utility analyses are the most commonly used types of economic evaluation in healthcare. They express outcome as a single, clinically relevant measure. In cost-effectiveness analysis, outcome is expressed in terms of an effect common to the interventions being compared, measured in a natural unit. Cost-effectiveness analysis is easily understood because it uses a clinically relevant measure of outcome. However, because only one outcome is chosen, 
health benefits may be under or overvalued. For example, if life years gained were chosen as the outcome measure but there was also a big difference in side effects that affected patients' quality of life, this would not be captured, and the benefit of the intervention would be misvalued. Also, results from one analysis cannot be compared with another that uses a different outcome measure, which can make it difficult for decision-makers to choose between spending options, particularly across different disease areas. Cost-utility analysis attempts to overcome these problems by using a general outcome measure incorporating both duration of life and health-related quality of life. The most commonly used measure is quality-adjusted life years, or qualis. Others include disability-adjusted life years or dailies and healthy year equivalent, or highs. Qualis are calculated by taking duration of life and weighting it with a measure of quality of life called utility. For example, if a treatment extends life by 10 years with a quality of life that is 80% of full health, 8 qualis will be gained. Combining duration and quality of life is covered in detail in the Health Measurement and Qualis Access Evidence Learning video. In both cost effectiveness and cost utility analysis, the analysis results are expressed as an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or ICER. This is calculated by dividing the incremental cost by the incremental outcome, which generates the incremental cost per life year gained. The ICER is therefore a measure of the additional cost of an extra unit of health. For example, a year of life gained when using the intervention instead of the comparator. However, in itself the ICER does not provide an answer to the question. Are the outcomes worth the cost? This will depend on the decision maker's cost effectiveness threshold, which is the maximum level at which they consider the outcomes of an intervention to be worth the cost. If the ICER for an intervention is below the threshold, the intervention is likely to be adopted. If it is above the threshold, it probably will not be. Cost-effectiveness thresholds should reflect society's willingness to pay for health improvements. However, while this is an area of increasing interest to researchers, there is no evidence as to what different societies are in fact willing to pay. Widely quoted thresholds have no empirical basis and any evidence that does exist suggests the figures should be higher. In general, decision-making bodies do not explicitly state a cost-effectiveness threshold, and their decisions are subject to other influences, such as the burden of disease and the availability or absence of alternative treatments. For example, a drug might have a relatively high ICER, but if medical need is considered great, Say if no other treatment options are available, it might still be considered worth adopting. Economic evaluation is important in understanding the value of a product, but is, however, just one part of the puzzle. In reality, what society is willing to pay for health improvements may even be different for different conditions. For example, there has been discussion in the Netherlands about having a range of cost-effectiveness thresholds that increase as burden of disease increases. As pressures on healthcare spending grow, economic evaluation is becoming an increasingly important means of informing and influencing decision-making. In fact, in some circumstances it is now a mandatory requirement. It is therefore an essential tool for pharmaceutical manufacturers, which need to convince decision-makers of the value of their products. In this video we have covered the key principles of economic evaluation, including types of analysis, the technical issues such as choosing the comparator, perspective and time horizon, types of cost, and the need for discounting.